Hey guys, Mike here from Lunch Money Comics. I'm in the beautiful White Mountains of New Hampshire and I'm hunting for comic books. No way! An actual Hulk 181 in the wild. I can't believe... Hey buddy, buddy, look where you're going. Buddy, look out, look out! No! Just kidding. Well, I am in New Hampshire and I was skiing, but right now I'm in Manchester, New Hampshire, checking out Double Midnight Comics and Games. Let's go check them out.
So that was a fantastic store, guys. I got a pretty good stack of back issues at a fantastic price. I can't wait to go home and show you guys what I found. So if you make enough YouTube videos, eventually you'll start making really dumb intros. Thank you guys so much for indulging that bit of silliness. I promise no actual Hulk 181s were harmed in the making of this video. Special shout out to my buddy Mike for hitting that fake comic book as hard as he possibly could. That thing went absolutely flying. We were cracking up. So I got to go to New Hampshire for a couple of days of late winter, early spring skiing in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but besides my passion for antiques and comic books, I am an avid outdoorsman. I've spent a ton of time in the White Mountains hiking, backpacking, and especially mountaineering. In fact, I've climbed all of the big peaks in New Hampshire before. It's one of my happy places. I love seeing it at any time of year. But whenever I go anywhere, I'm always thinking in the back of my mind about that other passion, about antiques and comic books. And whenever I travel anywhere, which is often, I always do a quick search for flea markets, antique shops, and comic book stores in the area I'm going to be. That's exactly what I did. I did a Google search, you know, along my route in New Hampshire to see if anything good was there. And I found Double Midnight Comics and Games. So the location you saw in that footage was in Manchester, the largest city in New Hampshire, but they also have another location just up the road in Concord, the capital. More on that location a little bit later. So you guys saw from the footage, you know, it was a comic and collectible store. They had things that you typically associate with these types of places, right? They had action figures, statues, board games, uh, CCGs. Um, they actually had some sort of, you know, customizable card game tournament going on. I didn't get to see the game, but there were a lot of guys playing. And of course, comic books. And there were a couple things that really jumped out to me about this store. You know, they didn't have a ton of wall books, but the back issues were excellent. So people who watch my channel know I collect older comic books, books from my youth and earlier, you know, Bronze Age, Silver Age. I don't often collect modern books, but that's not to say I don't collect them at all. You know, I have a wish list of books I'm looking for, and there are quite a few books on there from the last 20 years or so. The thing is, whenever I go to stores like this, these back issues tend to not have many modern books. Um, but this place absolutely did. They had a lot of modern books. Not only that, but they were incredibly well organized, which is always appreciated. You guys know, you go to these comic book stores and people riffle through them all the time and things get out of order. Not the case here. It was easy to find, you know, the title you wanted by, you know, alphabetical order and that everything was a numerical. So if you were looking for a book, I could just, you know, zone in on it right away and see if it was there. Really cool, really appreciated. I don't often see it. So because of that, I got a pretty awesome selection of comic books um, going all the way back pretty old to modern times. There are a lot of X-Men books in here. For those of you who like X-Men, you'll like this video. So before I show you guys what I got, you know the drill. If you like this sort of stuff, go down, hit that like button, leave me a comment. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, you can follow me on Instagram under Lunch Money Comics IG. Let me show you guys what I found. So first up, we have some Captain America comics. In this first one, I've been looking for for a little while for reasons I'm about to explain. We have Captain America number 341. It's from 1988, written by Mark Gruenwald, cover art by Ron Friends and Al Milgram. And what's kind of cool is the store would do this sometimes. They put the key significance right on the front. You see here, first appearance of Lamar Hoskins as Battlestar. For those of you that watched the Disney Plus show Falcon and the Winter Soldier, you saw Lamar Hoskins as the sidekick to John Walker's U.S. agent. There's also some other first appearances in here, really minor ones like left winger and right winger, also some members of the Serpent Society. But none of those reasons is why I wanted this book. The reason I wanted this book was, let me show you why. Hold on. This is why. So this is Daredevil number 43, one of my favorite Silver Age covers. Uh, it's done by Jack Kirby. And why I love this so much is you see Captain America fighting Daredevil and it's sort of a forced perspective. It shows Captain America sort of almost jumping off the page towards the reader. Jack Kirby did this on other issues as well. And I like to collect those. So you guys can see why I wanted this book because it is a direct homage from this one. Um, I love collecting these sort of homage covers, you know, uh, when they lift or riff on an older cover. I like to collect them and just be able to see them side by side. I think it's a pretty cool thing to do. And the reason why I know about this comic at all is because of one of you. Uh, back when I was talking about this book when I got it, one of my viewers went down to the comments and said, hey, if you like that one, you'll definitely like Captain America 341. Um, and they were right. So I looked it up and said, hey, this is a cool book. Put it on my list. I was happy to finally find it in a decent grade at a decent price. Now you see here, there's a price tag of $15. Uh, this store did have a, a discount program. Like if you got 10 comic books, it was 10% off, 20 comic books, 20% off. So I did break that 10 comic book threshold uh, to get that 10% off. So very happy to add this homage cover to my collection to go side by side with this one. Uh, the next book I got is also a Captain America book from the same run. 
This is Captain America number 354 from 1989. Once again, written by Mark Grunewald, another Al Milgram cover, I believe. And the significance here is that this is the first appearance of John Walker as U.S. agent. So John Walker appeared before this, but as Captain America. This is the first issue where he is taken over the moniker of U.S. agent and basically becomes a character in his own right. Really, really cool cover uh, showing him sort of punching up at the trade dress here. Once again, you kind of have that cool force perspective um, concept here saying, I'm back. Uh, very cool comic book. I've wanted it for a little while, but I didn't have to have it. Because, you know, when the Falcon and the Winter Soldier came out and it featured John Walker heavily, um, this book went up a lot in value. And I think it's a little overpriced. So I was waiting for it to come back down to earth. But you see here, it was $10. So I got it for 9 bucks with a discount. That's still a really good price. And the reason is, I don't know if you can see, but there's some pretty big color breaks right here. There's some folds going down. Um, that's fine. I'm happy to pick up this book for that cheaper of a price. I wouldn't really want a higher grade one anyway. So very happy to add uh, this Captain America book to go alongside uh, this one. Uh, pretty good pickups for the price that they were. So next up, we have a whole bunch of X-Men comic books, of course. I love the X-Men, but a lot of these are modern and I'm excited to talk about them. So let's go all the way back to 2001. Writer Grant Morrison wanted to sort of revamp the X-Men. And how they decided to do that was to take X-Men Volume 2 and just retitle it to New X-Men. So this is the first issue of the run. It's New X-Men number 114. It's 114 because they just continued the numbering of X-Men Volume 2. And this series is notable for several reasons. Uh, let's talk about the minor ones. They have new uniforms. Uh, Beast changes his appearance from like an ape appearance to more of like a lion appearance. Um, Emma Frost joins the team, which is something that would carry through uh, even to modern times. She is a staple of the X-Men team now as a good guy. Um, also, in this particular issue here, if you're talking key significance, it's the first appearance of Cassandra Nova, who is basically a parasitic uh, alien from the astral plane that clones uh, Professor X. Crazy. I'm not even going to get into that. Um, but she is a major antagonist for the X-Men. But the biggest reason why this series I, I like so much is that it changes some fundamental things about the X-Men, namely Xavier's school. So before this issue, Xavier's school really was just like a training facility for the X-Men. Not only that, but like if you guys look at the X-Men, there were a whole bunch of really good looking people with very useful mutations. If mutation was a real thing, you'd have most people in the world having terrible mutations or having them be useless or like really affecting their appearance. Well, that's kind of what they do in this series here. They basically make Xavier's school a school. And the reason is the year that before this came out, X-Men, the first movie came out in 2000. And in that movie, it was clearly a school. There were tons of kids with different cool and quirky powers. People liked it, responded to it well. So that's what they did in this series. They introduced it as an actual school. Tons of new students, tons of new mutations, tons of like weird, quirky characters, many of which would star in their own storylines moving forward and become staples of the X-Men series. So for that reason, I love looking for this series because you can find so many cool first appearances like Phantom X um, or Kid Omega or uh, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, who I think a lot of people know from the De uh, Deadpool films. So I'm always looking for these. So this is the first issue in the run, cool in its own right. But then we have number 117. So um, you can see right here, I was talking about Beast changing his appearance. He clearly has some like, um, you know, feline attributes here. This one here also is the first appearance of Beak who is basically um, a kid who has very, like, bird-type mutations. Unlike, you know, Angel from the X-Men, who is beautiful and has beautiful angel wings, Beak has, like, talons and a beak, and he's pretty crazy-looking. And had some pretty uh, pretty good stories moving forward. It's also the first appearance of Glob Herman, who is basically a mutant that uh, is covered with, like, a globby exoskeleton, and uh, you can see his skeleton underneath. It's pretty crazy. I love quirky characters like that, and this is the first appearance of both of them. Uh, and then we have this one. I've been looking for this one for a long time, guys. This is New X-Men number 118. And this one is notable because it's the first appearance of the Stepford Cuckoos. So the Stepford Cuckoos are, you come to find out, are clones of Emma Frost, right? It starts off with five of them. They look just like Emma Frost, only younger. And they have kind of like a hive mind, like this psychic hive mind. And they're very powerful. Uh, a couple of them die. There's three left. And then you come to find out there are lots of them. And they were all clones of Emma Frost. And they ended up becoming pretty major characters in X-Men stories moving forward. I think they're really cool. I was very happy, happy to get their first appearance. It's also the first appearance of Angel Salvador, who uh, I think some people saw from X-Men First Class. Very cool character. I believe she ends up having a relationship with Beak, who I just mentioned a second ago. So as a fan of the stuff for Cuckoos, I really wanted new X-Men number 118. Really cool cover, by the way, too. So happy to get these books. You see they were all a couple dollars each. Awesome deal right there.
So now we're moving to 2005 and one of my favorite X-Men stories of all time. So my favorite comic book ever is Giant Size X-Men number one. And what happens in that is the original X-Men team have gone missing. They've gone to a sentient island, bad things happen, and only Cyclops comes back. So Professor X puts a new team of mutants together consisting of Wolverine, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Thunderbird, Sunfire, and Banshee. I believe Havoc and Polaris are there as well. Um, basically to go back and rescue the original team. Well, they do. They're successful. Yay, happy day. They rescued the original X-Men. We have a new team moving forward. And for 30 years in real time, that was the official story until 2005. And that's when writer Ed Brubaker had a really cool idea. And he put it to words in this series here. This is X-Men Deadly Genesis. It was a six-part series. Here's issue number one. I think it's a Sylvester cover. And what you find out in this is that that story you heard in Giant Size X-Men number one is a lie. See, Professor X has been lying about this for a long time because the new X-Men were not the first team sent to rescue the original team. They were the second. Originally, Professor X took four other mutants who were uh, Darwin, Sway, Petra, and the third Summers brother, Gabriel Summers, to go rescue the original X-Men. Really bad things happen. Several of them die, and for as far as Cyclops is concerned, his brother Gabriel also died. Cyclops is so distraught about it that Professor X wipes his memory of the entire event and then recruits another team to go save the day. And this is a secret kept for a long time until this story here where you find out the actual truth. You also find out that Gabriel Summers, aka Vulcan, is still alive and he comes back as a villain basically swearing revenge on Professor X in the X-Men. So really cool story, really cool concept. Um, this issue here is the Sylvester cover, the original cover. And again, as a giant size X-Men number one fan, guys, how cool is this? You see basically an homage to that cover, only all the X-Men are zombies. Very, very cool. But there are several variants of this comic book. Uh, one of them had a Wolverine cover, which you might have seen in the footage, but it wasn't in great shape. But another one is this. This is, is the Casada variant. And the reason why I wanted this one is because right there on the cover, you see Gabriel Summers, a.k.a. Vulcan, because this book is his first appearance, and I wanted a book that also showed him on the cover. Uh, Vulcan's a really cool character in his own right, guys. He was mostly a villain. He's incredibly powerful, and not only is he a powerful mutant, but he's also uh, has very close connections to the Shi'ar Empire and a lot of space-themed storylines. So he's a cool character. I had to have his first appearance, uh, not only with the awesome GSX-1 homage cover, but the one with him on the cover. Um, you can see here, uh, these were both pretty cheap as well, uh, even cheaper with a discount. Very happy to pick these ones up for the price I did. So staying on the first appearance of mutant characters bandwagon, we have this next one. This is the New Mutants number 99, art of course by Rob Liefeld. And the significance here is, well, you see it right on the cover, it's the first appearance of the characters Feral and Shatterstar. So these were two longtime members of the Team X-Force. Uh, as a matter of fact, the next issue, uh, New Mutants 100, was the last of this run, and then it was rebranded X-Force number one. Obviously a gigantic comic book. In the early 90s, uh, they printed tons of them, made Rob Liefeld a star. Um, but yeah, you know, as a uh, completionist who wants all the first appearances of X-Men related characters, I had to have this comic book. But I've also mentioned the influence that the Marvel trading cards had on me as a kid and how I tried collecting first appearances of all the characters in the cards. Well, you guessed it, I also have those. We have a, a card for Feral and one for Shatterstar. Uh, the interesting thing here is on the back of these cards, it says their first appearance is New Mutants 100, which I think is technically true if you're considering it their first full appearance. I think this is their first cameo appearance. And for those of you who don't know who Shatterstar is, if you saw the movie Deadpool 2, he was in it very briefly before they sort of unceremoniously killed him off. So I had to pick up this book. You see it was listed as $10 with a discount. It was nine. I don't really think it was worth that, but still I had to have it. I'm happy to add it to my first appearance of X-Men affiliated characters collection box. Uh, so we have a really cool comic book coming up here. This is the Uncanny X-Men number 268. It's from 1990, written by Chris Claremont, cover art and interior pencils by Jim Lee. So we have some Jim Lee early X-Men goodness right here. Uh, awesome cover, obviously. You have Wolverine, the Black Widow, and Captain America. And the reason is, in this book, you find out via flashback about how these three characters met and fought side by side during World War II. Very cool, awesome cover. I've been looking for this for a while. There were several copies. I grabbed one of the higher grade copies. You see it was listed at $15. So with the discount, I thought it was a pretty cool deal. 
Uh, let's go back a little further to Uncanny X-Men number 210. It's from 1986. Um, the significance here is that it's the first appearance of the team, the Marauders. This also serves as the prologue to the storyline, The Mutant Massacre, which was a major part of X-Men history. Big storyline in the 80s. Very cool. And then let's go back even further to 1979 to The Uncanny X-Men number 117. This is a Chris Claremont, John Byrne collaboration. The significance here is that it's the first appearance of the Shadow King. And why that's important is, uh, it's mostly a flashback of Professor X a long time ago in Egypt, and he encounters this mutant, Amal Farouk, um, who is the Shadow King. It's the first evil mutant Professor X goes up against. He's a very powerful psychic as well. Professor X, you know, fights him uh, and beats him, but it's sort of the impetus for Professor X to start the X-Men. He realizes he needs good mutants to fight the evil ones that might hurt mankind. So it's important to the history of Professor X and to the X-Men. Also, it shows when Professor X first meets Storm in the streets of Cairo as a pickpocket. Uh, very cool there. For those of you who don't know who the Shadow King is, uh, maybe you watched uh, the FX series Legion, which is about Professor X's son, kind of. And, um, you know, in that story, in all three seasons they had, the main bad guy is the Shadow King. So um, if you haven't checked that show out, it's actually pretty darn good. So there you go, guys. I got three X-Men books uh, to add to my Chris Claremont run. Still chipping away at it. I got a great price, I think, for all three of these. Very happy to add them to my collection. So that was all the comic books I got at the Manchester location, and I got all of these for $77 with the discount, which I think is pretty great considering, you know, how many of these were on my wish list. But I did mention that there was also a Concord location, and I did actually have time to check out this store as well. So it had a lot less comic books. It was a little bit smaller, but they had a lot of gaming stuff. You know, they had a huge, you know, display case full of magic cards. They had Dungeons and Dragons stuff, painting supplies, a big room for card gaming. But they did have some back issues. But what really caught my eye was they had a row of like wall books way up near the ceiling. And one book up there really caught my eye. I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe it was because I was skiing. You know, I was surrounded by ice and snow. I saw this book and I absolutely had to have it. This is Journey into Unknown Worlds number 55. It's from 1956. It's some golden age horror and it's by Atlas Comics. So we go back, you know, to the 40s. We have Timely Comics. In the early 50s, it turns into Atlas Comics. And then in the early 60s, 1961 to be precise, Atlas Comics becomes Marvel Comics. So we have some pre-Marvel Marvel goodness here, and the editor of this book was Stan Lee. So there's multiple stories in here, but you see the feature story is uh, The Glacier Man. So again, I don't know why it spoke to me. The snow and the ice, you know, that's also why I threw on this uh, Hoth t-shirt right here. Uh, I just saw this book. I had to have it. It just has great colors to it. It's in really good shape, and it was listed at $40, which I think is a great value for this Golden Age horror book. Uh, something else uh, I thought was kind of cool, they also put their the store stamp on the back of the board here. Oh, I just thought that was really cool. So uh, very happy to pick that up this book, guys, uh, for $40. And it was sort of a good capstone for my New Hampshire uh, comic book hunting day. So there you go, guys. I got to pursue two of my greatest passions in life, getting out into the great outdoors and also hunting for some comic books. Uh, head on down to those comments, guys, and let me know which one of my pickups you like the best. I love reading through all the comments. I can't wait to hear from you. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you keep hunting for comic books in strange and unusual places. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next time.